Welcome to A Matter of Time by me at Open Source Bridge. <clears throat> so really quick, if you want to find out more about me, I'm an independent software developer. You can uh, hit me up on my Twitter account at JXXF, or you can read my very, very sporadically updated blog at JXF.me. So this talk is fundamentally a talk about assumptions and how we make them in respect, with respect to software development in particular, and how we try to realize particular software concepts in, uh, uh, how, sorry, how we try to realize real world concepts into software and some of the mistakes that occur, particularly with respect to times and dates. So normally assumptions are pretty good, right? I think these might be two perfectly reasonable assumptions that people would feel good about. And I think most people would play near fire or uh, go run up and touch a open high voltage power line. But sometimes when our assumptions break down, there are big consequences for that. So for example, here's a really simple uh, Python statement that seems to express a truth about two numbers being the same. So if we say A is 222 and B is 222, and we ask whether A is B, we not surprisingly or seemingly not surprisingly get the answer true. But if we change the numbers slightly, if we just add one more two, we get a totally different answer. In fact, we get the opposite answer. So how is that possible? What's breaking down about the assumption that two numbers should be equal to each other if they represent the same value? Well, the problem is that this particular implementation of Python, C Python, caches small integer values. And anything in the range of negative 5 to 256 is a singleton integer. So is is checking for object identity and not for value identity. It's checking whether those two things are the same object, not whether they have the same value. So it works for small numbers, but not for big numbers outside the range negative 5 to 256. Or how about this? Maybe you've, maybe you've been tempted to or actually have implemented a leap year method to test whether a particular year is a leap year. So how might one implement this method? Well, probably you'd start with checking if the year is evenly divisible by four. And if it is, like say 2004, 2008, 2012, then it certainly is a leap year in that case. But there's also an exceptional case, which is that if the year is evenly divisible by 100, then it's not a leap year. So we have to check that it's not evenly divisible by 100. But that's not the whole story either, because if it's also evenly divisible by 400, then it goes back to being a leap year again. So the straightforward assumption of the exposure to maybe the past four or five leap years might condition you to believe that every four years is a leap year. But that's not actually true. There are many, many exceptions to this rule. So we wind up with that, which is a far cry from the initial sort of naive version of checking for whether it's divisible by four. And sometimes the assumptions we make um, wind up in software, but they encode not necessarily a mathematical or universal truth, but rather a sociocultural assumption or something about the way people interact with each other. So here's a uh, query from a schema I worked on uh, in the Massachusetts Civil Service Department. And in 2003, the Massachusetts uh, Supreme Court decided a case called Goodridge versus Department of Public Health. And this is the case that was the uh, instantiator for legalizing same-sex marriage in the United States. But the problem was that all the databases looked like this. And updating a whole bunch of databases about uh, marriage licenses is really problematic if you, uh, if you have that, other than, you know, other than assuming certain properties about the people getting married, there's a lot of other assumptions going on here. What happens if people get divorced in this table, for example? What happens if, uh, how would you enforce that no two people can be married to each other at the same time? It's tough to do that here. <clears throat> so this talk is, although it's about time, it's also about people and the assumptions that people make and how those assumptions have consequences when represented in software. So time is hard, I'm not gonna lie to you, and I think that it's, hard for one very specific reason, and that's because we made it that way. And to understand why that's true, I think we have to go back to basics and kind of understand what we mean when we say time, because that represents a very broad, very philosophical concept. And in fact, people, including philosophers, have been arguing about what time actually means for a very substantial period of time, so to speak. Two different schools of thought are the sort of Newtonian school of thought and the Kantian school of thought. Newtonians think that time is sort of this empirical uh, 
uh, concept that exists regardless of whether people exist. So it's not something, it's a mental construct. It's something that's a physical property of the universe we live in. And if there were no people around to observe it, it would still be happening. So like gravity, for example, might be said to be a, uh, an example of that kind of construct. Even if there are no people around to observe gravity, it, it might be said that gravity nevertheless exists. The Kantian school of thought, though, says the opposite, it says that time is not an empirical concept, that if no people are around to observe the passage of time, then time it doesn't actually or can't be said to exist. So that's a really, those are really broad, deep topics. And for purposes of our talk today, we're just going to say that time is the property that separates events from uh, happening all at once. So just like space is what separates me from a member in the audience or you or any two people from each other, time is what separates events or moments from each other. So now we have the question of having decided on that, how do we actually represent that idea? Um, you know, we can talk about, it seems like we should be able to represent two distinct moments in two different ways and then compare their values to each other in some fashion. And if they have different values, then that should indicate a different moment in time. So to do that, we're going to have to think a little bit about the way that we might construct a system of time. And if we imagine ourselves as being among the first humans, among the first people to think about the passage of time and its representation, I think we can do a good job of coming up with a domain model. So let's see what that might look like. If we think about, if we put ourselves in the frame of mind of somebody 10,000 or 20,000 years ago who wants to mark the passage of time, they don't have a lot of tools available to them. They can, uh, they pretty much have to rely on nature to, uh, to see the passage of time or to check what time it is. And probably the most obvious place to start is maybe the most obvious cycle that occurs, the day-night cycle. So we can start from that point, and we can say that a day is basically one period long where the sun returns to its previous spot in the sky. So one of those units is a day. If you combine a lot of days together, you might notice that it starts getting colder or warmer at different points uh, or as many days go by. And you might observe that when you get back to a certain point that it's the same temperature on average as it was before. And we call that a year. So when the Earth completes a rotation around the sun, we've noticed that it's a year. But even if you didn't record temperature, you can check to see whether uh, a year has gone by by seeing if the sun has returned to the same spot in the sky as it did, as it did a year ago. So if it has, then your, so if, in other words, if at 9 a.m. it's the sun is at a particular point in the sky, one year later at 9 a.m. the sun should be at exactly that point in the sky again. There's also the other sort of celestial body in the, uh, in the Earth sky, and that's the moon. And we call a lunation one period of the moon going around the Earth. So with these three periods, we can start to assemble the beginnings of a domain model. So each of those cyclical recurring units of time is called a period. <clears throat> and time itself can be said, can we, one way to represent time is as a point in one of these periods. So we pick a period like a day or a lunation or a year. And we pick some spot in one of the cycles, and that represents a unit of time. So if we arbitrarily label our days and we say that we're in day 182, one quarter of the way through day 182, that's a particular time we might care about. I mean, there's all manner of arbitrary representations we might choose to represent that point in time. So here in the, you know, here in the 2015, in the US at least, we choose to represent times on a 24-hour clock. And so at that point, we would say it's 6 AM on that day. But somebody in the Sumerian civilization might say that that was the fifth night hour because they had 10 nighttime hours and 10 daytime hours with five nighttime hours at the beginning of each day, five at the end, and then 10 in the middle. So you can see that that kind of time system creates a few problems, right? Because your daylight hours will actually increase in length over time as the seasons change as will your night hours. So time is a point in one of those periods that you, care to, that you care to represent. A calendar is one level up from time. A calendar is a way of mapping one of the cycles 
uh, a way of numbering one of the cycles and mapping that to some string that you care about that's easier to remember. So instead of saying day 4,862, uh, you would have some more convenient notation for representing that. So in this case, we'll choose the day cycles because they happen most frequently. So that'll give us the most accurate representation of time. So the Gregorian calendar chooses dates based on a specific reference day that occurred in 4700-ish BC. And every day is numbered starting from that day. And that's how you wind up with November 10th or January 1st in a particular year, because we're counting the number of days that have occurred since that reference date. And that's how we, uh, and, and we're mapping the cycles in different ways. So we're mapping the year cycle to 12 months. But that's a totally arbitrary choice. We could have decided that there are 15 or 500 or 263 months in a year. There's nothing magical about the arrangement of words and position of, that, uh, of the elements in that string and the date. The date is just a arbitrary, arbitrarily constructed mapping from days to a string. So we can imagine, for example, a different universe, say, in Game of Thrones, where we have totally different cycles that are of totally different lengths that have totally different meanings in that universe. And even if we're on the same planet and we experience exactly the same uh, periods of time, it's a human construct, not a physical one, to decide to name day number 16 in a certain way. So a calendar is a mapping of those dates, of the, rather, of those days to dates. So now we almost have enough to say what time it is. Um, if I could ask everyone to breach conference etiquette for a second, or maybe just pull out your phones, and on the count of three, I'll ask you to yell out what time you think it is. So just take a second to look at your watch or your phone, and just yell out what time it is on one, two, three. OK, so I noticed most people said a hour and a minute. <clears throat> Did anyone not say an hour and a minute? Did someone say like PM, for example? You said PM? OK, so one person said PM. Um, so we can, we can say that, we, we can start with this. We can say, OK, we've got some hour and a minute representation of what time it is. Um, and we could get more specific than that, right? We could say the milliseconds or microseconds or uh, nanoseconds if we wanted to. And we would be more specifically identifying a moment of time. But the problem is that we haven't identified a point in time when we do that. Because time is actually a continuum, right? We saw in our day length before that you, if you go from one part of a day to another part of a day, that's a continuous interval. So when we talk about a specific moment in time, like 6.30, we're not identifying a point. We're actually identifying an interval. So the, where the statement, it's 630, is true on this line is not a point, but an interval, right? Because this entire space represents 630. It's not one point. <clears throat> now, certainly, the point where it starts to be 630 is a point, and the point where it stops being 630 is also a point. But the statement, it's 630, identifies a set of points, an interval, not a specific point. And maybe even more problematically, it doesn't identify, um, it, it doesn't help us to be more specific about the nature of what we're talking about. So if we add seconds to this representation, all we did was narrow the interval that we're talking about. We didn't actually shrink it to a point. We just made it smaller. So this results, or this leads us to the conclusion that moments are actually ambiguous. When we give a time, we're not talking about a specific point. We're talking about an interval. And the problem is that those intervals recur more than once. So if we don't say AM or PM, then we're talking about two possibly ambiguous intervals in the same 24-hour period. And of course, those cycles repeat. There's more than one day, after all. So every day, the same ambiguity occurs. So if we're talking about a larger time period, we're going to have even more ambiguous statements. And again, this situation is not helped by being more specific. If we add seconds or milliseconds or nanoseconds, we don't actually get any closer to a point. We still have, we're, we still have an interval. The reason that this works for humans, the reason that I understand you when you tell me that it's 2.42 or 7.45 or whatever, is I understand the context of what you're talking about. I understand what you're talking about today, sometime in the afternoon of the year 2015, et cetera, et cetera. And so that unambiguously identifies what interval you're referring to. Computers don't have that luxury. They need you to be specific about every cycle that could occur in our calendar 
and identify which cycle we're in. So if we have AM and PM, that's a cycle. We have to identify that. If we have 24 hours in a day, we have to identify which day we're talking about and which hour we're in. If, we, if, if the days recur in the course of a year as they do in the Gregorian calendar, we'll need to identify what year we're in and so on and so forth. So we need to be much more specific than just saying what time it is if we want to help a computer understand what time it is. So we can't just say it's 4 o'clock. We have to say it's 4 o'clock PM on a particular day and tell it what month and day we're talking about and the year. And we have to identify what calendar we're talking about, because remember, all of that construct is totally arbitrary. Hmm. So is this good enough? Does this get us to the point where we can work with times? Well, let's see. So if we ask a computer to give us a date that represents 4 o'clock on May 14th, then we'll wind up with this. Um, but there's an interesting part here, and we didn't ask for that extra stuff there. So what is all that junk on the end of that? You know, the number, I see that here's 2015, and here's 5 for May, and then here's 14. But what happened to the 16, and where's this, what is this minus 4 for? So why did, why did we wind up with that other stuff? And more importantly, can other stuff go there? Is, is that like an empty slot we haven't filled out in our description of the cycles? <clears throat> so it seems like there's something missing in our domain model of, what, of how we want to represent time. And the problem is that if we want to represent times uniquely for each person, humans want times to correspond to the solar day. So that means we want our morning times to be in daylight, and we want our evening times to actually be dark. So if I say 9 AM, you expect the sun to be out at 9 AM. But if, if we're going to agree about what 9 AM means, and you're in a different spot than I am on the planet, then we're going to disagree about where 9 AM should be with respect to what point in time that is. So that means that if you live, say, in South America, and you think it's 9 AM, well, I'm not going to agree with you that it's 9 AM in Australia at the same time, because it'll be dark for me. So this was resolved by, at least in the US, by a gentleman named Charles Dowd, who is a seminary teacher. And in the 1880s, he was traveling a lot for missionary work. And at the time when you traveled the railways, every city uh, that had a railway stop had a clock at the platform. So you'd get off the train, and you'd set your watch by the local time on that platform. Now, these weren't very well synchronized, so you could travel, say, 10 miles and get a totally different time than if you traveled 100 miles or didn't move at all. And this inconsistency is really confusing, because basically everybody was calibrating their local mean times to high noon of whatever the highest point for the sun in the sky was. That means that there's this total patchwork quilt of times. The next town over from you has a totally different understanding of what noon means than you do. So he proposed that the railway operators uh, because that was sort of the quickest way to get across the country at that time. He proposed that they basically standardize times by dividing the US into four time zones. That's the origin of how we wound up with the four time zones now. So Charles Dowd's proposal was that if we all agree to work from a common offset, we'll wind up in a state where we have uh, where we have a consistent understanding of time. We just have to pick some reference time and then agree to offset accordingly so that we wind up with the same solar day. So this means that two places on Earth agree to tell other places on Earth what their offsets are and to set all the clocks in that place according to that offset. So Charlottesville, Virginia, where I'm from, has one particular offset, and Maryland, New South Wales, Australia has another particular offset. Well, that only works if we're using the same calendar, right? Because we could have totally different representations of time. So in Charlottesville, we're using the Gregorian calendar. But in Beijing, you might be using the Han calendar for different civil purposes. So OK, let's all agree to use the same calendar. And then you know, maybe that'll resolve it. But if we do that, we're going to have to remember every time we switched calendars. Because if we go from one date representation to another, and we want to look at old dates, we're going to have to remember when we switched calendars so that the old dates make sense in the new system. So for example, when we switched to the Gregorian system about 500 years ago, we changed from another system called the Julian system, which is mostly like the Gregorian system, but where they started counting the days was different. And how they did leap years was also different. So when, a lot of, when, when several European countries switched from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar, they had to remember what date they did that on. 
And not everybody switched from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar at the same time. Some countries did it hundreds of years later. So if you do that, you have to keep track of not only when you switched, but when everybody else whose date you want to talk about also switched. You have to maintain, essentially, a giant database of when everyone switched from which calendars to which. So all right, we're all on the same calendar, great. But here's another problem. The offsets that we choose may change over the course of a year. So you, you've probably all heard of daylight savings time. So in Charlottesville, we're on UTC minus 4 in the summer, like now, but we're in UTC minus 5 during the winter. And Maryland, New South Wales, Australia has the same kind of deal. They have a different offset at different times of the year. But it's worse than that because we may decide to change our offsets at different times. So Charlottesville's idea of what winter is is a different idea than what Maryland, New South Wales's idea of winter is. So when we switch our offsets for daylight savings time is inconsistent among different countries or different time zones or different localities. And maybe even worse, we've changed our minds in the past about when we should switch from winter to summertime. So in Charlottesville, we did, we observed these time rules from 1917, uh, every year except 1917, 1942 to 1944 for World War II. And Maryland, New South Wales has a totally different set of intervals in which they did or didn't observe daylight savings time. Huh. And to complicate this matter even further, some of the times that we might want to talk about aren't real times. They don't exist because of the fact that we switched offsets. So if I talk about, for example, 2.30 AM Pacific time on Sunday, March 9th, 2014, and we try to give this to a computer, so we'll use some Ruby code and say, get me the time zone corresponding to Pacific time, and then get the local time that corresponds to the time I just said before, March 9th, to, uh, sorry, March 9th, 2014 at 2.30 AM. This doesn't exist. This is not a real time. And the reason it doesn't exist, there's, that is, there's no UTC time, there's no reference time that maps to that time. And the reason this doesn't exist is that that's the daylight savings jump ahead date. So at 2 at 2:01 a.m. on that date, we uh, sorry, at uh, 2:01 a.m. we jump to 3 a.m. on that date. When we fall back, we're going to have the opposite problem. Here's 1:30 a.m. on Sunday, November 2nd, 2014. Now, there is a representation for this, but the problem is that there's multiple representations for this because we experience that same moment of time twice. There are two moments in time that correspond to the string November 2nd, 1.30 a.m., 2014, because when we go from 1.59 a.m. to 2 o'clock a.m. on that date, we fall back an hour. So we pass 1.30 a.m. the first time, and then we go back an hour, and we pass 1.30 a.m. again a second time. So there are two different UTC reference times that correspond to that time. So this is another, uh, another problem to deal with. So clearly, our domain model needs to have some way to deal with this. We don't have anything that can handle the fact that people want to complicate the relationships between calendar and time. So how do we, how do we fix this? So we clearly talked about a few ideas that need to go into this new domain model. So we have this idea of a reference time, a time that we all agree on as being some kind of standard. And then we have local times that are different for each person or different for each locality. And then we have some way of offsetting the difference between our local times and the reference time. And that's basically what a time zone is. A time zone is a mapping of all the reference times you would care about to the offsets at that point in time. So when we change daylight savings time, for example, that's going to be an entry in this table. Uh, whenever we decide to change the dates on which daylight savings time occurs, that's going to be an entry in this table, and so on. So, uh, so Pacific time specifically looks like this, for example. Um, what, what, during one of the many, many entries of this table, we would see the entry for 2013's uh, spring ahead date. This is when we go from UTC 8 or minus 8 to UTC minus 7. We went ahead one hour. And likewise, the fallback date for this year is we're going to go from UTC minus 7 to UTC minus 8 in November. So this gives us a framework to deal with each particular time zone. But this is complicated because we've got to remember this for every possible time zone. And fortunately, there's a standards body called IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, that maintains a specific database of this stuff called the time zone database, which you may, 
have seen referred to as TZDB or TZ data uh, as referenced by different libraries on Unix-based systems and Windows-based systems. So the solution to the problem is to identify one time zone for every distinct list of historical offsets we want to remember. So every set of offsets that we want, that's a time zone. So here's what the time zone data looks like for um, Pacific time. So you can see there's a couple of parts here. First is this block called rules, and then there's this block called zone. And the rules block describes recurring events that are, uh, that are always present each year. So this is where you include things like daylight savings time and so on. The zone block describes how you're going to name that, that set of rules and when you switched offsets at different time. So the rules block up here tells us that, for example, from 1962 to 1966, in October, on the last Sunday of October at 2 AM, you're going to go from a one hour offset to a zero hour offset from this base, uh, this base offset down here. <clears throat> And the zone rules identify um, how to describe the time zone. And they also tell you when it started and if, it, if, if it's applicable when it ended. So you can see there's a date here in 1883 when everyone switched from LMT, that's local mean time when you're just setting your clock by the sun, to the actual time zone, in this case, uh, Los Angeles. <clears throat> the reason it's called Los Angeles as opposed to Pacific time is because different cities, as we'll see in a second, have different rules about uh, when that occurs. And there isn't necessarily a consistent definition of what Pacific time means. So for example, in Indiana, they're quite finicky about which cities observe which parts of daylight savings time. So if I ask the TZ data database for all the Indiana-based time zones, it turns out there are quite a lot. And the reason that we can't just say central time or eastern time is because each of these cities has at some point in the, in the past or possibly in the future decided that it's going to observe a different set of daylight savings rules at different times or to have different offsets. So you can go from one corner of Indiana to the other and pass through as much as 12 different time zones. <clears throat> So this is really problematic, right? We have, to keep, we have to keep storing this data every time somebody makes a political change or, uh, or, or does anything to change the offset of the time. So fortunately, you don't have to really do any of this yourself these days. Uh, there's a lot of interfaces to TZ data and TZDB that makes things simple. Um, all of these are open source tools that will help you deal with that. So if you're using Java, Jota time is really good. If you're using uh, Ruby, we have some support and active support, but not a lot. Python has some support in Pi, TZ, and Arrow, but not a lot. .NET has Noda time, which is a port of Jota time by a guy named John Skeet. And then JS has moment.js to sort of uh, patch over some of the big problems that JavaScript has with dealing with times. So that's kind of what's going to go in this slot, is the relationship between how we represent times and how we communicate time is handled by this time zone database idea. But again, that's only applicable for a specific uh, calendar and time pair if we switch to, say, the Julian or Han calendars, we would need an entirely separate TZ data. So now we talked about how to communicate the idea of time, but now we want to actually do some kind of operations on time. And one of the most important uh, things that we can do is make sure that we express intention when we're doing mathematical operations on time. And the problem is that it's really easy to get burned by dumb mistakes or even, uh, even small violations of the assumptions about the way time works lead to really big, really problematic errors. So consider, for example, the difference between the nature of these two statements. If I ask a alarm clock app to wake me up at 6 AM every day, do you think that means that it should shift when I move to a different time zone? Or do I mean 6 AM in the local time or wherever I am, every, uh, no matter where I am? Now consider something like, this call is on the 29th of every month at 2 PM. So do you think that means that I, it should be 2 PM local time all the time on the 29th of every month? And what happens when we get to February? What does that mean? If, if it's not a leap year, do I go to March 1st? So there's something different about the fact that we want 6 AM to mean a specific moment in time that's 
not about the, uh, it's not, it's not going to change when we move to a new time zone. And there's something different than that when we talk about, I want to make sure my idea of time is synchronized with everyone else's idea so that I am not going to miss the call that everyone else thinks is also at 2 PM. If you try to do math operations on these kind of ideas, though, it usually winds up poorly. Um, you're going to wind up adding times to things that don't make sense to do, or you'll do it in a way if it's not very portable, or if it leads to problematic errors, because you're not expressing the intention of what matters. So we need different versions of time to express different ideas about the kinds of operations we would want to do. And the biggest, most important distinction that we might care about is the difference between a duration and a period. So a duration is a specific amount of time. It's an exact length of time. 500 seconds is a duration. There's no disagreement about how long 500 seconds is. But one day is a period. A period is, uh, is based on cycles of our calendar. It's not based on a objective measurement of time. It doesn't change. So if I say one day, that's not the same length of time depending on what day I'm talking about. A day in which I jump ahead for daylight savings is more seconds long than, it, than any other day. So the periods depend on a notion of the calendar which is not specific to a, uh, it, it unambiguously identifies a length of time, but it's a length of time that's based on a calendar rather than being objectively some amount of time. So to see what we mean by that, let's take a look using the uh, Java 8 API for, uh, for what it will look like if we do some simple date math operations. So first we'll say, let's get an instance of a calendar, and we'll say, uh, don't allow us to be lenient with the calendar, be really strict. And we'll start with the date January 30th. So here's a calendar that's pointing to the date January 30th. And now let's say we want to get the date that's two months in advance from this date. So there's, a couple of, there's a couple of ways to do that. One is we can keep incrementing by one until we get to the point that's two months out. The other is to just increment by two directly. So if we increment by one twice, we'll get this date, March 28th. That doesn't seem like it's two months after January 30th, because what happened was we went one month forward, and the last day of February is February 28th. Then we did it again, and one month after that is March 28th. But we really want it March 30th, right? So if we add two months, we'll get March 30th. But this seems weird. Why, do we, why should we have to know that that's true? Why should we have to know that property about our calendars? And this reveals a breakdown in kind of how we want this to work, which is that this is not associative. We want associative operations. We want to be able to do that in any order and still wind up with the right answer. So to maybe further illustrate the problem, here's three different dates corresponding to November 1st, November 2nd, and November 3rd of 2014. And on November 2nd, we're going to have a daylight savings time transition from uh, uh, going forward one hour, or sorry, going back one hour. If we want to know the difference between C and B, that is November 3rd at that time and November 2nd, versus the difference between B and A, that is November 2nd to November 1st, we can ask the duration of those two periods. So we can say, what's the difference in seconds? That's an objective duration. It doesn't matter what calendar you're using. We can ask for that difference, and we'll get one answer for this period. And we'll get a different answer for this period. Because even though these are one day apart each, they're a different objective amount of time apart. You'll be waiting longer as the clock turns to go from one of these days to another. So you can see that the uh, difference between November 1st and November 2nd is an extra 3,600 seconds or one hour from the difference between November 2nd and November 3rd. But if we do this same operation with periods, we won't wind up with, the, with this issue. The number of days in between these two dates is identical. These are both one day apart, and these are both one day apart. But that's based on days. It's not based on, um, it's not based on any other cycle. So I could have a period that was, say, days. And I could say, get me, the, uh, get me a time that's uh, 12.01, one minute past midnight for November 3rd, 
and then 11.59 p.m., one minute right before midnight. Those would be two minutes apart, but they would be one day apart. So that's kind of a counterintuitive idea, right? That something could be as close as uh, a couple of seconds to another time and yet be a totally different day, and that's because the periods changed. So even though this is, uh, even though these are, even though the start of these periods is uh, 90 or 90,000 seconds apart, the number of days is only based on the cycles that we're talking about in our calendar. <clears throat> so we need to add one more idea to our domain model here. We need to add this idea of duration. And now that we have this framework that we can work with, we have enough to be able to store times, right? But we have to remember that when we're doing that, we need to store them in a way that the computer will understand. So we need to store all the cycles that we ever care about, so year, month, day, AM, PM, et cetera, et cetera. We want to store them in the reference time, not in local times. We want to store in UTC rather than Eastern time or Pacific time or whatever. And we don't want to store with offsets. We don't want to have to memorize the offset. We just want to be able to say that this is a reference time. So if your, say, database server is using some offset um, to map those times, you're going to have problems depending on where you move the database. If you move it to a different server that has a different understanding of what time it is, you're going to have misinterpretations of the times that were stored. As opposed to if you only stored reference times, there can be no misinterpretations because you know that it's reference time. You don't need to remember an extra piece of information about when, uh, about time zones or about when, uh, uh, when you put that data in, what time zone it was, or what offset it was. So together, this gives us the framework to actually be able to store time. All right, so in conclusion, time's are really hard. It's our fault for making it that way because we came up with really complicated representations that only other humans can understand. And computers have to deal with the fact that we made it messy. And as a consequence, we all have to uh, write software in a way that accommodates that fact. There are libraries, as we saw before, that accommodate some of those limitations and make our lives easier, but they all have their own quirks and they rely on a specific understanding of the domain model that I described before. Even worse, some of them may have different ideas of what words like duration and period mean. So for example, some, uh, some libraries consider duration to mean what I described as period, and some libraries consider period to mean what I described as duration. So the importance here is, is on being precise about what you mean, like the alarm clock example. Do you mean 6 AM at a specific moment in time, or do you mean 6 AM that's going to change no matter where you are so that it's always 6 AM? So those are very different ideas that require very different ways of storing data. And unless we're precise about what we mean and how we want to store that, we're going to wind up with problems. So thanks very much. Uh, I'll give a shout out to the Open, Open Source Bridge organizers and volunteers, uh, to Gary Bernhardt for reviewing this talk for me, and to you guys for coming out. Thanks very much. <laughs>